The concept of a natur, of an eccentric artist so committed to their craft, does invite negativity from time to time, and understandably so. If the auteur does something great, they tend to reap all of the credit, inadvertently disregarding everybody else that helped their project come to life. This becomes even more problematic in the gaming industry, which is arguably more of a collaborative medium than any other form of art. So when a director takes all of the credit away from the animators, coders, art directors, and sound designers, it tends to provoke a greater degree of ire. While there is truth to this criticism, this does not extend to everybody who would fit the broad definition of auteur. There are a lot of video game auteurs that are not obnoxious and pretentious, but are just trying to help video games advance as an art form. And let's not forget that there are still many people who don't consider video games to be art. Sure, some of them may be overzealous and a bit crazy, but it's those traits which are often responsible for producing new and inventive ideas, ones that their teams then take and build up into all-time classics. Today, I want to celebrate those within the gaming industry that embody the auteur archetype best. Those who have the most distinctive styles, progressive ideas, and sometimes, yes, the most over-the-top personalities. Before I get into my top 10 list, I want to provide a qualifier as well as three honorable mentions. Because my definition of an auteur is somebody who helps the medium of gaming to progress, and the definition of the word progress means moving away from a starting point, I won't be including people who were instrumental in birthing the video game medium. This means you won't see people like Shigeru Miyamoto who I think has the more honorable title as an architect of gaming. As for my three honorable mentions, one is Chris Avalone, who for my money is the best writer in the history of Western video games, thanks in part to his often deeply philosophical narratives. Second is Hideki Kamiya, for his diverse repertoire, ranging from survival horror staples like Resident Evil 2, and visually gorgeous and emotional games like Okami. And finally, Dan and Sam Hauser, for their diverse repertoire, including their writing style and gameplay design. And of course, for setting the standard for open world video games. Now, with that down and out of the way, here are what I believe to be the top 10 auteurs in video games. Number 10, Hidetaka Miyazaki. Famous works, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. Yeah, I can already hear a million voices crying out that he should be higher on the list, and you know what? I don't blame them. Ever since Demon Souls in 2009, this man has been churning out nothing but 9 out of 10 and 10 out of 10 games, and he did it by gifting the world the Soulsborne formula. Make your game difficult to play, and your story even more difficult to understand, but make the combat state-of-the-art and the world so damned intriguing that you empower the gamer to rise above these frustrations. That is the Soulsborne formula in a nutshell, and 14 years on, it has yet to be surpassed or equally imitated, despite numerous attempts by other developers. This alone merits Miyazaki's place on this list. Now despite this, I still put him at the bottom of the list for a couple of reasons. First, compared to a lot of the other people on this list, his time as a developer is comparatively small. Plus, even though all of his games are immaculate, they are, at root, the same gameplay formula. Albeit brilliantly evolved versions of the same gameplay formula. At some point, I would love to see Miyazaki do something that didn't use the Soulsborne formula, something that really demonstrates his artistic range. Give him 5 or 10 more years to do that, and he could easily be in the top 5. Number 9. Sam Lake. Famous works, Max Payne, Alan Wake, and Control. When it comes to Sam Lake, you can always count on two things being present in his games. The first is his Lynchian tendency to twist reality. His characters and his worlds are always breaking the boundaries of what should be possible, and when this happens, he exploits it for all of its goofy joy and its unsettling horror. Even in a more grounded story like Max Payne, he has the nightmare levels which, though a famous pain in the ass, manage to provoke opposing feelings of charm and disturbance, especially when Max breaks the fourth wall by saying he's in a computer game. 
The second thing is Sam's commitment to including something in each of his games that we have never seen in any game prior. With the first Max Payne, it was the inclusion of realistic faces on the character models or should I say attempted inclusion. With Alan Wake, it was the revealing of the plot before it happens, yet still maintaining suspense. With Quantum Break, it was the mixture of the medium of video games with television. While these things worked with varying levels of success, one cannot fault Sam for always trying to push the boundaries of what video games are capable of, artistically speaking. When he comes up with an idea that he feels will push those boundaries, he will commit to it and see that it comes to fruition in the best possible form. Case in point, Alan Wake 2, which has gone through four different iterations and is finally releasing 13 years after the first game. For these reasons, even if not all of his games are equal in quality, they will always be, at the very least, interesting and progressive. Number 8. Fumito Ueda Famous Works, Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian. I can't imagine what it must be like to be in a pitch meeting with this guy. Yeah, so the game is called Eco, right? And it's a seven hour long escort quest. Four years later. Yeah, so the game is called Shadow of the Colossus, and it's a giant open world game, but there's literally nothing to do there except travel to a bunch of bosses on your horse. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. Kudos to the investors behind these games because they helped produce two of the most influential games of all time. Seriously, all the people behind the greatest games ever seem to cite Eco and Shadow of the Colossus as an inspiration, including Hidetaka Miyazaki, who cites Eco as his main inspiration to make video games in the first place which makes Ueda inadvertently responsible for all the controllers we smashed while playing Sekiro. While the greatness of these games is not limited to one motivating factor, one of the primary factors is Ueda's minimalist design philosophy, which he calls design by subtraction. By removing things like a heads-up display, or a complex combat, or multiple characters, the gamer is left to derive value from the elements that are left over. This is what enabled things like the relationship between Eco and Yorda to be so powerful, or the feelings of isolation and shadow to produce deep contemplation and melancholy. It's because the gamer invests more of themselves in the few elements that are present and subsequently gets more out of them. Though many other games have followed Ueda's model with great degrees of success, it has never been perfectly replicated. But game developers will never cease to try because it works so damned well. Number 7. Todd Howard. Famous works, the Fallout, and Elder Scrolls series. Ah, Mr. Howard, you are the gift that just keeps on giving. Not just with your games, but with the memes you inspire. This man has probably spawned a greater number of memes than the total sales of the Elder Scrolls and Fallout series combined. And it's all thanks to his auteurish, overzealous ambition, which unfortunately sometimes takes the form of broken promises. Now in his defense, there are a lot of times where his ambition and his promises are realized, like with Morrowind and Skyrim, the latter of which has maintained insane popularity for over a decade, because he and the people over at Bethesda have succeeded enough in their ambition, there are still enormous contingents of people looking forward to the highly ambitious Starfield and of course Elder Scrolls VI. It's this level of dedication to boundary breaking that people are naturally drawn to. So much so that when mistakes are made and lies are told, like with Fallout 76, people will come back to cheer him and Bethesda on, albeit reservedly. Even if, God forbid, Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 don't turn out well, we will still love Todd Howard, because at least his sweet little lies will be immortalized in the keenest memes that the internet has to offer. Number 6, Suda51. Famous works, Killer7, No More Heroes, Lollipop Chainsaw. Of all the people on this list, Suda51's design philosophy is without a doubt the most progressive and original. Unlike most game designers who follow trends and reliable established formulas, every aspect of every game Suda51 puts out feels like a full-blown rebellion against common game design paradigms, be it with his sometimes taboo subject matter or unconventional mechanics. 
A good example of this is with what I believe is his magnum opus, Killer7. That game is a mostly on-rails shooter, with a story that broaches many touchy subjects like politics, mental health, and abuse. This is not the sort of thing that is going to appeal to a broad audience, who would prefer greater freedom of movement and would prefer to, you know, not have a breakdown over humanity's capacity for evil. That said, unless we break those boundaries and see if new artistic territory can be established, neither video games nor any other art form will advance. Suda51 is one of very few artists who attempts to do that with his games, and by god, do we need more people like him. Yeah! Number 5. Tetsuya Takahashi. Famous works, Xenogears, Xenosaga, Xenoblade Chronicles. I think it's fair to say that the fundamental goal of most game developers is to make a great game. But for Tetsuya Takahashi, that is simply not good enough. When he makes a game, it not only has to be the greatest, most epic game ever made, but the greatest, most epic game that will ever be made. Take Xenogears. That game's story is so densely packed. It's like the entire story of Metal Gear Solid in one game. Moreover, it was originally supposed to be one episode in a six-episode series, but naturally, due to this thing called reality getting in the way, much of the content in those other episodes got condensed into the one game we got. Then, when Squaresoft wouldn't let Takahashi continue with his vision, he founded his own studio and tried to do his six-episode project again with Xenosaga. And again, he couldn't finish it, having to settle for three episodes. Even though the vision behind those games was never fully realized, the mixture of story and gameplay that we got was of such a quality and depth that, in my opinion, it maybe has yet to be surpassed. That is the result of a man who always shoots for the highest possible ideal, and only takes business constraints into consideration when absolutely necessary. Very few people in this world possess that level of commitment to their craft, and we are lucky enough to have him working in our beloved medium. Now let's just pray that with the Xenoblade Chronicles series, the scope of his original vision can eventually be realized. Number 4. Yoko Taro. Famous works, Drakengard, Nier, Voice of Cards. Most people who have never heard of Yoko Taro will probably take one look at him and assume that he is the embodiment of the self-important auteur. But those who do know him and have played his games would never change a thing about him. Fans like myself understand with perfect clarity that there is a direct correlation between his eccentricity and the quality of his games. In fact, I'm on record for saying that I believe his game, Nier Automata, is the most profound video game ever made, and I attribute a lot of that to his auteurism. Like Suda51, Yoko Taro is constantly trying to employ original methods and ideas to make his games not only stand out, but progress the art of making games. When it comes to script writing, he has famously stated that he writes the endings of his games first and then works backward. When it comes to the gameplay, he will constantly have the camera angles shifting around. But I think the most impactful part of Taro's style is his willingness to tackle the most philosophically and emotionally difficult questions that plague mankind, be it the meaning of life or mankind's instinctual drive to kill. Somehow, though, he manages to derive the essence of these difficult ideas and make them easy to understand, while maintaining their emotional pain and the wisdom they confer. These and other techniques combine to give Yoko Taro a distinct and arguably irreplaceable voice in the gaming medium, one that will inspire many future game designers for decades to come. Number 3. Ken Levine. Famous works, Bioshock, System Shock 2, Thief the Dark Project. There are certain things in video games that we all take for granted. With stealth games, hiding in dark areas to avoid detection or using sound to draw an enemy's attention seem like givens. With action games, RPG elements like repairing and modifying your equipment or increasing certain stats over others are ubiquitous to the point of obnoxiousness in the modern day. But there was a time when these things were new and mind-blowing, and Ken Levine played a large part in maybe not birthing all of them, but evolving them to the highest standard. 
Each of his games have a finesse and universality to their storytelling and gameplay that makes them timeless classics. I can pick up Bioshock or System Shock 2 either now or 10 years from now and have a more meaningful, fun experience with them than I do with the latest shooter or RPG. Granted, Ken, like some auteurs, has demonstrated a level of ambition with some projects that reportedly made their development strenuous, particularly with the upcoming Judas, which has apparently taken over 10 years to meet Ken's standards. Nonetheless, I have all the faith in the world that when it eventually releases, it will continue Ken's legacy of great game design. Number 2. Hironobu Sakaguchi. Famous works, Final Fantasy, Lost Odyssey, Parasite Eve. When Hironobu Sakaguchi first started working on games at the beginning of the 1980s, the idea of a successful role-playing video game was inconceivable. Though he desperately wanted to make one, he spent the first several years of his career cranking out games that responded to the popular trends of the time. It wasn't until the foundation for successful RPGs was set by series like Ultima and Dragon Quest that Sakaguchi was begrudgingly given permission to work on his RPG. That RPG, of course, was the first Final Fantasy, a project that almost nobody believed in at the time including Sakaguchi himself, who was planning on going back to college if it wasn't successful. What nobody expected was that Sakaguchi would infuse those games with an archetypal framework and style which would enable him and his team to constantly push gameplay and storytelling boundaries, particularly but not limited to the likes of Final Fantasy IV, VI, VII, and IX. Thankfully, his influence was not limited to just that series, but some of the greatest games ever made. You can feel his creative touch and the hardcore perfection of games like Chrono Trigger, Parasite Eve, Kingdom Hearts, and arguably one of the most underrated games of all time, Lost Odyssey. Though his modern work doesn't reach the heights of those games, they continue to be well-received and break new artistic ground, like with his most recent game, Fantasian, which uses real-life dioramas for environments. Though he has hinted that Fantasian might be his last project, I hope he can find the strength to do one or two more, because to me, his ideas have and will continue to feel fresh and interesting. Number 1. Hideo Kojima. Famous works, Metal Gear Solid, Death Stranding, Police Knots. While he isn't as eccentric as Yoko Taro, or as ambitious as Tetsuya Takahashi, or as innovative as Suda51, I believe Hideo Kojima represents the best balance of all these and other auteurish traits. When you think about all the disciplines that go into making a game, music, story, graphics, animation, and, of course, gameplay, Kojima's games have always been on the cutting edge of at least one of these fields. For example, the first Metal Gear Solid game, when it released in 1998, was considered a perfect summation of all of these disciplines. It is also largely credited with popularizing the stealth genre, as well as turning games into as much of a cinematic medium as it is a gaming medium. These and other disciplines would continue to be refined to new quality standards in his subsequent games. Granted, like I said at the beginning, it's important to not attribute the success of the games he directed strictly to him, even though it's hard to do because Kojima's idiosyncratic style shines through with every aspect of his design. Not everything he does is universally well received, like with Death Stranding. But even with that, one can respect his attempt to explore new gameplay formulas and maintain quality standards regarding graphics and cinematics. At the very least, one can say that Kojima has consistently tried to introduce progressive ideas with mass appeal for over three decades, and he has succeeded enough that I believe he merits the number one spot on this list. And there we go, that's my top 10 list of video game auteurs. Do you agree with my choices? Is there somebody I missed? Let me know in the comments section below, and please, keep it civil. Special thanks to Indy for their help editing this video, as well as reviewing my entry on Suda51. And special thanks to Delphine for her help with my entries on Yoko Taro and Hironobu Sakaguchi. 